Well, good morning, Riverside. <laughs> There's my youth over there. I don't know whether to start or to awkwardly wait while they walk past, but I thought we would start. So if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Sizwe, um, and I have the privilege of serving at Velocity. I get to head up Velocity, and I get to work with these crazy people that shout things like, this is my mom. That's, that's, that's my people. Uh, I also um, sometimes get to preach, which is such a privilege for me, um, and also work with Solid Ground, our pre-teens, which is such a joy for me. And yeah, so as a church, we, we've been in this series called Unstoppable, right? Where we've been learning about the Holy Spirit, and Steve has been talking to us about the Holy Spirit. We were in the book of Genesis, and we were going from the book of Genesis, going all the way to Revelation, okay? And so it's been, it's been such a fun fun journey, an informative journey. I don't know about you guys, but it's been such an impactful series for me personally, just learning about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. But today we're going to press pause on that. I'm actually going to invite you guys. Could you guys lift, lift your one hand? Lift your one hand. We're going to press pause together. Okay, ready? One, two, three, and pause. There we go. Okay, it's how we do it at Velocity, guys. We interact, okay? So we're going to press pause in that series, and today we're going to look at one of Jesus's um, claims about himself, one of Jesus's aspects, right, and what he says about himself. And I really believe that if we put our trust in his word, man, there's real freedom waiting for us on the other side of that. And so as I was thinking about this, um, this aspect, the way Jesus describes himself in this verse that we're going to read, it reminded me of a story a while ago. Um, so if you haven't noticed yet, I have a gap in my front two teeth, right? Those two don't meet, right? It's like the Red Sea, they split, okay? But not only that, okay? I chipped my one front tooth once, okay? So what had happened was, okay, I was sitting in the lounge, right? In the way our house is designed, I was sitting in the lounge. If you get up straight from where I was sitting in that lounge, you can go straight. There's a dining room table. If you walk past the dining room, dining room table, there's a small arch. Through that small arch, there's the kitchen, and if you turn left, straight down the hall is my room. Simple enough, okay? So I was sitting on the couch, load shedding happens, right? And clever me decides, you know what? I, I've done, I don't need to find the nearby light. I don't need to look for the light nearby, right? I used Because I used to play this game as a kid where I'd close my eyes and I'd figure out where I am in the house, right? Because I didn't have many friends, so that's my game. Okay, so I'd close my eyes and figure out where I am in the house. So I figured, you know what? I know the house well enough. I've done this before. I don't need to find the nearby light. I can go to my room and sit on my phone. I'll be fine. Okay, I don't need the light. So I get up. I walk past the dining room table. I walk past the small arch into the kitchen, and then I turn left. I can feel, okay, there's the fridge. Okay, there's the wall. Okay, there's the light switch. Okay, I'm going past. There's the bathroom. There's the first room. I'm going past the, the second room. And I can feel the door to my room. I'm like, okay, I'm safe. So the door's open. And as I walk in, I hit smack bang in the middle. I hit this wall. And I feel something moving in my mouth. I'm like, I didn't have a snack. I don't know what this is. And I realize it's, it's my tooth. It's a part of my tooth. And because everyone was asleep. And I didn't want to wake everyone up. I did one of those silent screams. And you know, just like, you know, you couldn't, like, you couldn't, no noise could come out because mom was going to wake up and that's going to be worse than the toothache, actually. So we don't want that, right? So I go in my room, I go on my bed, and I'm just like, oh, this is so, so, and it is so painful, right? And it, it, it got me thinking as I was um, thinking back to the story of how a simple solution of just finding the light that's nearby, instead of doing that, I thought I could navigate in the dark and find my way to where I wanted to be. And if you turn with me to John 8, verse 12, if you don't have your Bibles with you, that's okay. There is the verse on the screen. Or lean over and make a new friend and read the Bible with them, right? So when you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, they're not ready yet. We'll give you two more seconds. There we go. Okay, let's read together. Jesus spoke to them again saying, 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Right? Pretty straightforward verse. But even before that, so before John 8, 12, the Pharisees who are the religious leaders of the time, they bring this woman who's been caught in the sin of adultery. They bring her in and throw her at the feet of Jesus. Right? And, and they're waiting to see what Jesus is going to do. They anticipate. They say, Jesus, we caught this woman in the sin of adultery. What are you going to do about it? Right? Because the law of Moses says we need to stone her. But what are you going to do about it? To their disappointment, instead of condemnation, Jesus brings compassion. Right? And they were disappointed at this because they're expecting Jesus to, to be angry, to, be, to, to throw stones at this woman. But instead of condemnation, Jesus gives compassion. And I think the reason why Jesus is able to give compassion, because Jesus recognizes here, like me, when there was load shedding, right? This woman is navigating life in the dark, right? She's trying to find her way in the dark. There's no light where she's at. She's trying to navigate in the dark. So Jesus is able to give her compassion instead of condemnation. And so what, what does it mean to be living in the dark? A simple, very simple definition of living in the dark is this. Life without Jesus. That's what it means to be living in the dark. And I don't mean just being saved and giving your life to Jesus, Right? And we're going to discover that it's actually a little bit more. It's, it's actually, we're going to unpack this statement and see how, man, life is dark without Jesus. And I believe there's, there's three of us, three type of people in this room, okay? So bear with me and see where you fit in. Okay, I believe the first group of people, I call them the ESCOM Christians. Okay, so see if you're in the ESCOM Christian category. Okay, the ESCOM Christians, what happens is, when it's stage one, right, when there's one difficulty a day and you can manage it, you're fine, right? You still go to your light, you find Jesus, you still have your good devotions, the light's on, let's find the on switch here, right? Nope, it's not working, there we go. The light's on, you turn to the light, you're finding Jesus, it's still good, right? But as soon as it gets to stage four or five, right, when there's like f five, six different problems now that you're needing to manage in the day, no, no, instead of turning to Jesus and turning to the light, some of us, we actually turn away from Jesus, navigate in the dark, try to find our own solutions, right? And then we bring Jesus these three or four options and say, okay, Jesus, here, yeah. okay, bless my option now. Okay, bless the best one, okay? We, we find another problem, the coworker, that's annoying, right? We, we, we don't turn to Jesus and pray about it. No, no. We, we, we find our own solutions. Okay, Jesus, should I kick her in the shin or park her in? Which one? Bless it. Right? So we come to Jesus with our own solutions. Right? Instead of turning to him first, man, when things get really difficult, it's easier to go away from Jesus. Try to figure it out. And we navigate in the dark instead of turning to Jesus first. Right, and the second category of people, man, you used to turn to the light, right? You, you knew the light, you knew Jesus, you had relationship with Jesus. But man, maybe somebody in the church who claimed to be in the light, maybe that person, they hurt you. Maybe they said something that really affected you badly, right? Maybe you've been hurt by the church or maybe, man, maybe there's guilt Maybe there's shame, maybe there's condemnation weighing you down. And you don't even know where or how to turn back to the light, to turn back to Jesus. Maybe you don't even know where to begin to look for Jesus, where to begin to look for this light. Right, maybe you're in that category. Or maybe you're in the last category. I call this category the vampire Christians, okay? Not the vampires, just call you vampires. And the reason why I call you vampires is because when the light comes, right, you, you hide, Right, you, you go away from the light. Right, like a vampire is like allergic to the light. Right, because the world also does this thing where it calls what is light dark. Right, and what's actually darkness, it claims, no, that's actually the light. So maybe in this category where, man, the world has twisted maybe your view 
of what is actually good and what is actually evil. So when true light actually comes, when Jesus actually shows up, it's almost like you're avoiding it. You're allergic to that, right? Like a vampire would avoid the light. A vampire would avoid the sun. Maybe that's, that's where you're finding yourself this morning, where the world is twisted, the understanding of what is good and what is evil, right? But wherever we find ourselves, whether an ESCOM Christian, whether you used to know the light and have a relationship with the light, but man, something's keeping you from turning back to the light, or maybe in the vampire category, wherever we're finding ourselves, man, we need to turn to the light, right? We need to turn to the light, not as a third option, not as a fourth option, not as a maybe, but as our first option, turning to the light. And so back to John 8, 12, Jesus here, he's fulfilling a prophecy. Right, they've prophesied about him that this man, Jesus, he's going to be the light. Right? And the Greek word used here is tufos, right? Very weird word, but that's the Greek word. It says tufos. Right? And what this word actually means, it means a little bit more than just light. It's this self-sustaining light. It's self-sustaining. In the New Testament, it describes Jesus as God's self-sustaining life. Right? In other words, God is not dependent on anybody. God is not dependent on me. God is not dependent on my good works. It's not about what I do or don't do for God. He is God all by himself. And for those maybe who feel the pressure to be performing for God, man, it's so comforting to know that he's God all by himself. Whether I turn to the light or not, he's God, he's still there. Whether he's my first option or not, he is God and he's still there. Right, he is God all by himself. He's self-sufficient. He's self-sustaining. And it's so comforting when we feel tempted to perform for God. And so again, for those who are feeling like, man, I need to perform for God. I need to do these things for God. He doesn't need that from you. He doesn't need that from you. And so if you're finding yourself either in category one, two, three, Or three, what I've learned to become true, inevitably, wherever you're finding yourself this morning, is that if we keep navigating life in the dark, eventually you're going to hit a wall, right? And I did that and I hurt my tooth, right? And I had a bit of pain on my tooth. Sometimes we do that with our lives, right? And imagine the pain and the hurt, of of navigating the dark and end up hitting a wall like you would with your life. If there was so much physical pain, when we did that physically, when I walked in the dark, imagine the immense pain that we would go through by navigating in the dark, by doing this all by ourselves. And man, it's not to say that when we find the light, when we turn to Jesus, things are gonna be perfect. No. But what it does mean is that there there's an intention, God's intention that I get to walk in. There are things that are avoidable that I get to see and foresee because God is with me, right? There's those things that I get to avoid. There's those walls, those pitfalls, those sins that I get to avoid, those struggles that I get to avoid as I walk with Jesus in the light, right? There's those things I get to avoid now that I walk with Jesus in the light. So if there's so much pain physically, imagine the pain if we do that with our lives, if we're navigating the dark and risking in that way. And so again, for, for the first group of Christians, if maybe you identified with the ESCOM Christians, maybe when it gets more and more difficult, it's easier or it's more tempting to find your own way first before turning to Jesus, right? If you're finding yourself there, if you find yourself as this ESCOM Christian, Man, my my challenge to you, my challenge to you, which I've said already, is that we don't look to our own solutions first. And because sometimes as Christians, right, we have Bible verses to back up what we do, right? We say, no, no, okay, the word is a lamp unto my path, right? So I take God's word, right? I take a verse and I run with it in the dark and I run with it, right? But I'm leaving Jesus who claims to be the word, 
right? I'm leaving him behind, but I'm taking a small little verse and I'm navigating on my own and saying, no, no, Jesus said I could do this, right? I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? So we take some of those verses and we, we run with it, but we're still navigating in the dark, but we leave. We leave relationship with Jesus. We leave counsel from Jesus. So if you're finding yourself there in those difficult moments, man, my challenge is that at every stage, whether it's stage one problem or stage 10 problem, man, could God be the first place you turn to? Could Jesus be your first solution? And if you're in category two, and if you're in the second stage, right, and if you're in the second group, and you've been hurt, maybe by somebody who claims to, to be in the light, Right? Or maybe there's guilt and there's shame and there's condemnation that's stopping you from having a relationship with God like you would have and you used to. If you're finding yourself there, man, my challenge to you is firstly to realize that God is searching for you. Jesus is searching for you. And so would you dare to allow yourself to be found? Would you allow yourself to be found? Right, would, while Jesus is searching for you, would you put up your hand and say, Jesus, I'm here. In your mess, in the guilt, in the shame, in the weight of it all, allow yourself to be found and say, Jesus, I'm here. This is where I'm at. Not cleaning yourself up first, but to allow him to find you where you are. And man, maybe you're struggling with comparison. Maybe you see these nice Instagram posts, right? Where the Christians, they post nicely highlighted and there's a nice coffee there. And you're like, no, no, my life is a lot more complicated than that, right? My quiet time with my three kids screaming at the back is not that pretty. And maybe you feel a bit condemned by that, a bit guilty by that. But Jesus wants to find you where you're at. So are you willing? Are you willing to be found. And if you're in the last category, he's the vampire, right? If you find yourself there, where, because the, the world also teaches that, right, not only maybe if Christianity doesn't exist, no, no, but rather Christianity or God and the values of God, those aren't good for society, right? What God values and what God deems good, that's not good for society. That's, that's what the world teaches sometimes. Maybe that's where you're finding yourself this morning, a bit skeptical. Maybe you didn't even know a light existed to begin with. Maybe you thought navigating in the dark was normal. This is how everybody does it, right? Everybody hits these walls. Everybody has these crises. Everybody has these things. But this morning, I'm here to say there's a light. There's a light. And there's God who loves you, Jesus who died for you, who wants a deep and genuine relationship with you. So if you're there, would you dare believe in this God who loves you, who cares for you? And I know you might even feel like there's, there's some loopholes in this thing of faith, right? But my challenge is that you don't need to know everything. You don't need to understand everything for you to understand that you're loved and that there's a God who died for you and that there's Jesus who wants a genuine relationship with you to give you life and life abundantly. Right, to have this genuine, full life. Not this perfect life when there's no problems, but a full life. And so, now that we're learning to turn to the light, we need to learn to live in the light. Okay? So we've turned to the light, and now we're going to learn to live in the light. And I'm going to invite my friend, Tlutliso. He's going to help me illustrate, yeah? Give it up for Tlutliso. Hey, it's a good looking lad here. So he's going to represent God, right? Because he, he has the light, you can turn on the light. He's going to represent God, okay? And so if this room was pitch, back, pitch black, right? Imagine that. This light doesn't turn on the whole room, correct? It wouldn't illuminate this whole room, right? And where God could just flick his fingers and everything is lit up, and everything in your life is crystal clear, right? Because if everything's lit up like it is right now, I don't necessarily, I don't need this, right? Because I can walk off and I can figure this out on my own, right? 
But the option that God chooses is one that keeps you close. Right? Because if there's a crisis in my life and if there's an issue and something's happening and I don't know what to do and, and he gives me a solution and he's pointing me in a direction. You guys didn't hear it, but he whispered in my ear, said, Caesar, let's turn here. Right? Because proximity allows for relationship. Right? And I can hear his word. And so when he says, let's turn, I can turn with him and the solution is right there. However, if I choose again, there's another crisis, another situation, and something's happening, and I don't know what to do, but okay, I'm going to go fix it. I'm going to walk off. I need to fix it. I need to attend to this issue. I didn't even hear him this time. I didn't even hear him say, see, there's the, that's where we need to go, son. Why? Because now I've, I've walked off. I've, I've tried to figure this out on my own, right? Because where there's distance, there's no relationship. And if there is, it's shallow. So the option God has chosen for us is one that causes us to be close. Is one that causes us, causes me to be near because I need to hear him and I need to see him. But if I'm going to figure this out and navigate in the dark on my own, eventually I'm going to hit a wall. Eventually I'm going to be so far off I won't even recognize what the light looks like anymore. Thanks to Brent. Guys can give it up for T-Boy then. So we need to turn to the light. We need to live in the light. But then we need to point to the light. Right? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but this world is a dark place. People are in dark places. And the reason why velocity exists is this, is that teen disciples would make disciples, right? So as, as teenagers are being discipled, our aim is that they themselves will make disciples, point people to the light, right? That's the reason why we exist, is to point people to the light. So teenagers in their high schools, on the sports field, they're pointing people to the light. Because people are in a dark space, and maybe there's somebody even sitting next to you who's in a dark space who needs somebody who lives in the light. Because our lives need to give testimony of, of where we say we're at, right? Our lives need to give testimony. So when we live in the light, then only can we properly point people to the light, right? So there could be somebody sitting right next to you who needs somebody in the light to point them back. Say, hey man, there's light. There's Jesus. And so church, my, my challenge to you, wherever you're finding yourselves, would your first option be to turn to the light? And then would you, would you stay in the light? Because there's no point of picking the light up and then when something difficult happens, okay, you put it down and you go solve it yourself. So would you turn to that? Would you live in that light? And then man, would you be brave enough to point people to the light? Because people need Jesus. People need this light that we have. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we, we humbly come before you this morning. And God, we, we just want to be people of the light. God, we want to repent for the times where we've turned to our own vices, where we've turned to our own things, where we've turned, where we've turned away from you, Jesus, to solve this on our own to heal on our own, to medicate on our own. So Jesus, we, we want to repent of those moments. And Lord, we want to turn back to you. And Lord, would our gaze forever be upon you? Would we live in the light? Would we be people of the light? And Jesus, would we point people to that light? As much as we're broken, there's people out there who are broken and in the dark. So Jesus, would you give us the courage to be bold enough to point people to the light. In your name we pray. Amen.